from my television memory, you will always be Balkan. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Nigel was Balkan. Do you remember Balkan in the big Sidex commercial? And Nigel was Balkan. Uh, he was always stuffed up. Um, that's before he had his hand up. Um, and you were a property on Market Treasure Island too. Yes, and uh, Christmas Carol, and uh, Labyrinth, and uh, Marco Top Shop. It's from uh, Miss Jocelyn Stevenson, who's at the back, who was the producer. No, she's at the front. Oh, Jocelyn would never be at the back. Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah. um, uh, now, to, uh, just so that I can establish what, what's going on here today, there's an elephant crawling now. Because um, I said, uh, Chris said to me, don't be surprised, he said, if a film crew from Central TV arrive. I said, no, don't be surprised if an elephant walked into the room. <laughs> I, I did actually, earlier, um, you may not have noticed, but earlier, uh, I was coming out of the uh, gents' toilet and I passed the Queen. Uh, the spitting image Queen, of course. And, and I just thought, this is all a bit crazy. Now, I believe you brought Hartley with you. I have, yes. And uh, there's at least one person in this room who remembers the last <laughs> adventure that I had with Hartley. Now, um, Gail Renard, who was one of the writers of Pipkins, is unable to be with us today because she's not. Thank God for that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why are you woken me up? After all these years, Harvey. Yes. Well, I've woken you up because do you remember the last time we performed together? Do you remember it? Uh, no, I've forgotten it. I thought you'd forgotten it, yes. And you spend 20 years in a cupboard, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> this is Hartley here. Um, hands up those of you who recognise Hartley. One, two, two. Uh, uh, oh. a, a number more than two. Now, you were, um, many say you were the star of Pipkins. Yes, I did. <laughs> and I am many, or equal to many. Mm -hmm. How did you come to be in Pipkins? Did you actually audition for it, or did you just come in and tell them you were taken from it? No, no, I was an old woolly jumper. Can't you tell? I was, I was made out of an old woolly jumper. Yes, that, and that's it, really. That's the story. That's the story. It's a bit like Kermit being... Um, the, the spring coat, yes. The spring coat, yes. I see it. Now, I have a me yeah. I, I, I have a message for you. Um, I got I got a message. There it is. Yeah. No, no, there it is. Right, got a message. You can't read that out. I can't read. Yeah, I've got to read that out. It's a message from Tom. Do you remember Tom? Oh, yes, Tom. Tom, who was played by Jonathan Kidd. Really? Yes, son of Sam Kidd, for those of you who remember. Son of Sam. Son of Sam, John <laughs> And Tom sent me a message uh, a couple of days ago. He said, Tom, well, this is for you, Hartley. Yes, I'm, just, I'm all ears. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, feel free to call. Um, Tom says, Yes. Has your personal hygiene improved? <laughs> As it was always a bit whiffy. Because he said, there should have been an episode, Hartley and the deodorant. <laughs> it was one of the reasons Octavia buried her head in the sand. Oh, really, he can talk. You, know, uh, you see, when you spent 20 years in the cupboard, as I just said I did, uh, there was no chance for a bath. Not even a dry clean. Yes, you are a bit whiffy, actually. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm worried here because uh, years ago I interviewed Kermit the Frog, who's... Not, yes. not as nice as you. No, well. He's not as, not as big as you for a start. <laughs> he's American. Um, American. He's American, yes. <laughs> so and I interviewed Kermit the Frog, and I found that in spite of the fact that um, his creator was sitting right next to me, I kept holding the microphone and the frog. <laughs> yes. And I'm doing the same thing again. <laughs> See, I don't really have a voice, as you know, so he, he, this thing here, always, he always follows me around. What kind of a relationship do you have with Nigel Plaskett? Very close. <laughs> Very close. Did you know him before? Uh, no, no, but now I know him intimately. 
And Nigel, did you know um, Hartley before? No. Uh, uh, look, at, look at that, how he changed his voice, isn't that good? I didn't see the jumper. No, the idea was that he was supposed to be made out of a jumper at the beginning of the programme, as were all the puppets, they were all supposed to be made out of all the, the scraps of rubbish. Because they were the, the, the original premise was that it was a puppet shop, and it was Inigo Pipkin yeah. uh, who, who sort of made the puppets and, and so created them. What, what was it about Hartley that made him, the, because Harold Hartley did become the star of the show, there's no question about it. But he was always written as the lead character. Yeah. And uh, so he was, it was always going to go that way, but, um, but he was a bit of every man. He, every, there was a bit of everything in him. There was, uh, you, know, you could identify yourself somewhere in his character. He was, you know, absolutely out there, open. You, you really always knew what he was thinking because he said it. it was, he wore his heart on his sleeve, so it was, uh, it was very easy uh, to play on that way. Now, one of the great things about really good puppets and really good puppeteers... Um, that's your hand, isn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> one of the great things about really good puppets and puppeteers is that they never stop being in character. And we, we saw in that clip uh, with Jim and Frank that uh, apart from the fact that they made Russell Harty laugh, and I have to say, I always thought it was quite difficult to make Russell Harty laugh because I was never sure he had much of a sense of humour, but it, they made him laugh. But they remained in character throughout, and uh, I remember the first time I interviewed you, Harty, you remained in character throughout, and, and that was wonderful because the thing is that the more you do that, the more you believe. That, I mean, I was sitting here, I believe that Harty here is real. Too. Yes. <laughs> Do you believe Hartley Hare is real? Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yes. No, yeah. never mind fairies. Sorry, sorry. Puppets. Yeah. Um, do you, did you find when you were doing Pipkins that you had to stick rigidly to a script? Because of course there were scripts written because it was an <laughs> educational program and it had to go through God knows how many committees. Or did you just make as much of it up as you went along as you could get away with? Are you asking me or him? Both of you. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, we, we, um, we had to um, stick to the script, obviously, because as you said, it was an educational programme. So pretty much we stuck to the script. But we played around in between takes, and the writers would come in. It's a good job Gail's not here today because she, would, she might contradict me in this, but uh, they would watch what we did between takes, and they would then use that in the programme. Maybe in the future they would kind of uh, incorporate some of the stuff we were doing. So there was a chance to develop the whole thing really between us. The, the crucial difference between you and Hartley and Jim and Kermit was the money. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, was the fact that you didn't create Hartley? No. And Hartley wasn't you and you wasn't Hartley? No. If you no, see what I mean. That's right. Because the first time I met Jim, I actually thought he was Kermit the Frog, even though he didn't have the puppet. Um, whereas you're quite different from Hartley. Yeah, well, Jim did kind of use his own voice more or less to be uh, Kermit, I think. Whereas I had to create two or three different voices that I wanted to make them really. And how many puppets did you actually operate? About four or five, I think, during the run of the show. Um, there was the tortoise. And he spoke like that. He was a bit slow and a bit East End, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I looked after the money. Wasn't very good at it, was I? <laughs> yeah, and and, uh, and then I also did the voiceover narration, which was my own voice, more or less. Uh, Angus McHare, Uncle Hare, uh, <laughs> and all derivations. Oh, uh, Mooney the Badger, I did as well. Uh, so it's, it's several different. Characters. And I tried to make them all as different as possible. Did you ever find, or particularly when you're working with Hartley, um, do you find that as Hartley you can say and do things that you couldn't possibly do as Nigel? Well, not, not, not on TV with Hartley, I don't think, because you know, I, had, uh, I had to think about uh, the, the, the programme really, but, but you can say things with puppets you know, that you can't say with with uh, humans, I think, and I've been involved with Avenue Q, the musical, for the last 13 years now. That, on stage, says a huge amount that uh, you can say with puppets that you can't say if you do it with humans, because I've seen them try and do the show without the puppets, and it doesn't work. 
Partly a question for you, but what do you think of the modern generation of puppets like uh, Haggerty Doll, puppets like that? Do you, do you think that they're kind of got a bit uh, over the top, a bit carried away? Oh no, look at their city. You've got to wave, you've got to wave everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Sooty. <laughs> bye bye, Sooty. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye, no, no, well, sadly, he can't tell us that, can he? No. <laughs> seeing audiences like yourself over the years that have watched it and laughed at some bits of it. Um, out of that, oh, here we go. Got my own mic now. Yes. I see. <laughs> um, and it's funny in life you do things and unexpected things sort of happen. So as a result of making that film, and I made the puppet, and I wrote the story, and I made the props, and I made the special effects, and I actually... Which learned... is hugely impressive, Jeff. Oh, thank I mean, you. It really is hugely That's very impressive. Kind. That's very kind. Well, I mean, currently I work for, uh, for BBC Television, uh, BBC News, as an editor, and I actually learned to edit on that film. I actually hired a Steam Beck editing system, and I have a book, The Focal Guide to Editing, so that's how I sort of learned how to edit. But in the meantime, before I joined the BBC, I actually, uh, uh, one day I got a telephone call because we were running that film as a short in Australia, an art cinema. And um, I got this phone call from them one day, and we were running it as a short before Thunderbirds had gone. So there was a legitimate reason for running this little short. And I got this phone call one day, and they said, oh, could you come up to the cinema because there's a young chap from New Zealand who makes films who wants to meet you. And I said, well, that's fine, I'll pop up. 
I met this guy and we had a lot in common, a lot of interest and so on. He said, oh, if ever you come over to New Zealand, you know, look me up. So about six months later, I went over there and I ended up doing some work for him and I ended up directing some television commercials for him. And of course, that was Peter Jackson. So it's strange how you set out to make something without expecting the sort of dividends that you get in life as a result of that. And I ended up working with um, him on two or three different productions. Um, and then I ended up working with this little fella here. And I wrote an episode for Temps TV and also built some props and uh, did some work on the city show. We've actually got some stills. And I'm hoping to talk through some of the stills if the gentleman can <laughs> fire them up. Okay. Now, let's just, let's just, let's just, <laughs> let's just, let's just, let's just, City, city, let's just think about this for a moment, city. We haven't been able to get the lights to work. Yesterday, we couldn't get the sound to work, right? So, what do you think the chances are that we can get these stills to work? That's <laughs> lunch. <laughs> We'll do our best. Well, what it is, I worked on the show, the Sooty Show, in 1989, and I wrote an episode for Thames called A Very Special Day, which I know you've all seen, and you all have <coughs> quite a definition of. Um, but, as I say, that film's very special to me because it meant that it was able to sort of kickstart a few things and take me in directions which I couldn't have even imagined when I made the thing. So. If you had lived in the 60s, Doing kind of what you do and knowing what you know now, do you think you'd have been working on, on a puppet series? Or would you have been editing news? Would, would um, I don't know. I never expected to be editing news, to be honest. Um, but, I mean, recently I've made a definitive documentary about Sooty. So I've made a two hour documentary which we were hoping might go out on BBC Four, but there have been some incredible delays because of. Um, uh, budgets and things that BBC4 had these days, they can't afford as much as they used to. Sooty, Sooty as a, as a, as a uh, in showbiz we call them properties, and Sooty as a property has passed, changed hands quite a few times, yes. not always uh, with, with a great deal of happiness I think. Um, well, originally, I mean a lot of you probably grew up with Matthew Corbett, doing the Sooty Show. Well, excuse me, I grew yeah. up with Harry. Yes, you did. Yes, I wasn't going to mention it, but there you have one. Um, now, of course, there was a changeover from, from Harry to Matthew, whose real name is Peter, by the way. It's not Matthew Corbett, it's actually Peter Corbett. And funnily enough, he lives about five minutes away from where I now live, which is very, very odd. I saw him in the street once by accident. Literally, I was all on canal to tow paths, and I said, well, you know, I recognise you. And suddenly he recognised me, and we got chatting and stuff. So, that's sort of another one of those happenstance things that occurs where I sort of thought about it. I work in news and I do documentaries and things like that. And I thought, well, maybe the definitive Sooty documentary, and it's actually called Sooty Ungloved The Bare Facts. Oh. Okay? Which, <laughs> um, now, I'm just going to talk you through a couple of these. Is that okay? Yeah. I'll, yes, I'll do. Through. Um, I'll, Can you see all right, Hartley? That's, that's a very young me up there with Sweep, and I've just repaired his bathtub because it was leaking. And just to give the game away a little bit, underneath Sweep is like this rubber glove, which has got like a rubber seal around the bottom, which seals into the bottom of the bath, which means you can fill it up with water without the water going everywhere all under, over the puppeteer underneath. <laughs> um, so that's one of that. That's us out in the street um, filming with a radio control sooty which I built. That's a bit of, I don't know if you can see much of that, that's a bit of the insides of the radio control city. And these are some tops that are on the, the stage show. Um, can we go to the next picture, if you just forward it? Right, as you can see, there's Matthew being an idiot as usual. Um, these are some sequences we filmed out in the park at, um, oh, Richmond Park, that's right. Which, the problem with Richmond Park is it's on a Heathrow's flight plan. So we kept on having to stop for every few minutes for a plane to go over until we could do the next bit of filming. Um, there's the little radio controlled sooty there. Um, Matthew asked me to build this because he wanted to do more shots, or rather the director wanted to do more shots, where Matthew could walk up to sooty, like in the street, or sitting on a car bonnet or something like that, rather than holding on to this thing always. So that was the idea behind that. Um, if you go to the next one, 
Ah, right. Now, there's the city mobile. If I was to tell you my car broke down one day and I couldn't get to work, and Matthew, who owns a couple of Mercedes cars, said, don't worry, I'll loan you one of my cars. <laughs> and I ended up driving that for two weeks. <laughs> being followed down the motorway by station wagon estate cars full of kids trying to look in at the thing. So eventually my girlfriend, we kept one of these in the glove compartment. So as they're coming along on the fast lane, we're driving along, she'd get it out of the glove compartment and do this and give a little away. <laughs> and you've never seen a car full of kids so active and lit up in your life. I've all, I also got stopped at pubs, in pub car parks, and I made the mistake once of parking that vehicle in the only empty spot in a place called Frimley Green, near where the uh, Frimley was where uh, the, the Matthew had his storage building and rehearsal hall. I parked in an empty spot, went over the road to a spud you like to get something to eat, and made the mistake that when I came back I realised I parked it out the front of the local kindergarten and all the kids had just oh, come out. No. So I had to go back into the spud you like for another hour until the crowds did because they were wanting all the grass and the way to meet Sooty, and of course I didn't have Sooty with me. Um, <laughs> There's some more shots there. That's the director, Stan Woodward, this chap here. And you can see that's um, uh, Matthew and another guy there who's done sweet for many, many years, Brian Stanford. He still does it to this day. Um, you ring him up on the telephone and he's got the squeaker in his mouth and stuff like that. His man's obsessed. Um, that's, that's when this went out of control. It rolled down the hill. Um, and uh, this is the thing they lie on to do walking shots of sooty and so on. Um, if you go to the next uh, slide, we'll go through this fairly quick. Oh, right. That's just another one out on location. And are there any more? Ah, right. There's the interior of the radio controlled city. Magnets in the feet. Um, a little spike so you could screw it into the ground. Um, yeah, very painful, very nasty. Um, For city. Yeah. Um, and this had a, a bit of an ignominious, I think that's worth it, that's hard to say. Ignominious end in the on an episode of Sooty, they had this puppet sitting on a grass patch with all these police dogs looking at it. And when it started to move, one of the police dogs took a liking to it and lunged at it. And I don't know what's happened to it since, but <laughs> um, but it didn't come off uh, very well out of that incident. I have to say, Jeff, that, that coming from the generation I come from, there is something mildly shocking doing sooty with legs. Yeah, I know. Uh, well, the, the thing about doing sooty with legs is that it's, it's what the actual legs look like. And sometimes you see this shot where two little legs stick up near, like Sooty's doing a handstand or something, and you see these two little legs. But it was always a matter of debate between me and Matthew Corbett as to what the legs actually look like. Well, it looks like Sooty is actually wearing some kind of tunic. Uh, <laughs> a tunic? Well, this sort of folds over the legs at the bottom. It's got a little bit of Velcro in there and stuff, but uh, it's so that we can get the mechanism uh, to the mechanism yes. to repair it and to charge yeah. batteries and so on. But, it, it, I mean, this poses a kind of a, a philosophical question. Should a glove puppet ever appear with legs? Do you have legs, Hartley? I've got arms. Look. Oh, yeah. I've got arms. Yes, you've got arms. I've never had legs. No legs? Actually, I did have legs, but I took them off. Uh, more trouble than they were worth. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, should a glove puppet actually have legs? I don't know, it's a good question. You'd have to ask the puppet. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, you just ask the puppet. It's too yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does, no, it, there's, there's something there strange was, about it. Actually, I'll tell you something strange. When I was working on, because um, not only I work on the Sooty show, I also worked on Cosgrove Falls' <laughs> Wind of the Willow show, mm -hmm. which obviously are uh, stop motion puppets with legs. And at one stage, I was shown a film that we made, a test film, from the very early 70s, which was stop motion of Sooty. It was called Sooty and the Great Bone Robbery. Right? <laughs> Obviously, great train robbery, great bone robbery. Yeah. And, of course, the puppets there had legs. And it looked bizarre. I mean, it really did. A, the puppets weren't particularly well made. But it just looked strange to see these characters sort of walking around, because you're used to seeing them sort of doing this. And um, yeah, it was quite disturbing. Is it true that the current owner of, of Sooty had that film destroyed? Um, the film actually sort of disappeared. I mean, I know where the film canister for it is, but the thing that Richard Goodell did try and get the rights to in this trial was the animated series. Um, I think it's called Sooty's Adventures? Sooty's something like that? Uh, yeah, that's the one. Now, Richard is very much um, in tune with 
the fact that these things are puppets and they need to remain puppets. They shouldn't be people. Well, that's kind of what I was getting at with this, this thing about having legs, you know? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the document, the, well, the, the, the stop motion production definitely didn't have legs because it never got made. Mm. Um, but it had legs in it, obviously. Um, I don't know. I, I think that it, the fun thing for the audience sometimes is knowing that they don't have legs, but then seeing shots with them with legs, like hanging over the edge of, you know, they're sitting or something, there's two legs dangling down. You know there's a bit of a trick there. But I think, I I think, think there, is, there is a kind of a, a, a thing that you shouldn't mess around too much with, a, with an original puppet, especially when you're, because you're tinkering with people's memories. Um, you're tinkering with memories of childhood, or you're tinkering with, with a character that they've come to know and love, and suddenly bolting them <laughs> with a pair of legs, or something else, is, is a difficult one. Um, I mean, how many of you uh, were brought up with one, one or other of these puppets and, and are well aware of the fact that they don't have legs for a good reason? Yeah, yeah everybody. Um, you accept that the puppet doesn't have legs because you know that that's, that that's kind of how they, how they work. Um, I don't know, is Ronnie still out there being a TV star? Yeah, I think, I think they're doing this ITV stuff. So, yeah. Claire, if you could. I'll tell you what, I have some more stills. If you were, would you like to see any more of the stills? I've got yes, let's try. I'll talk to you very, very quickly. If we get somebody to push the button for us, let's go to the next one. Oh, there's some. This is actually, you can see this puppet here? That's him there. Only in 1989, he hasn't aged a bit, has he? <laughs> Look at that. Well, the, That's the incredible. The only grey hair in one of his ears. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've aged. Um, this one here, this is an interesting picture. I'm going to point this out. Uh, I mentioned before I've done this documentary, two hour documentary about Sooty. That painting there used to hang up in Harry's practice room at his house in Guiseley in Yorkshire. And that is the only photograph that exists of that painting. And I took a picture of it in Australia when Matthew Crawford was touring. He actually brought the picture along and mounted it to this, um, you can see one of the cases that the touring show came in. And as far as I know, that is the only existing picture of Harry's painting that used to be on the wall in this thing. So I'm very proud to have taken that picture. Um, if we go to the next one, perhaps. Are there more? They're sweet. Oh, we've got some sweet fans here, and I'm glad to see you. You're either a sooty or a sweet fan. And it's been, I don't know, who's, who's a sooty fan? I'm a sooty Right, okay, who's a sweet fan? Yes, what is going on here? Sooty's here in person, you know, he's very offended. So it's sweet because... Oh, there he is. Tristan's over there with... There he is, he's got sweet as well. the real There he is. Oh, hello. This is... Now you see, here's the thing. Chris just said there's the real sooty. Yeah. I'm not sure. I've seen more than one real sooty. No, we're, we're going to let the cat out of the bag here, aren't we? Um, there was well, actually, the uh, there was 76 made <laughs> originally. And about every three years, Matthew used to get another 40 or 50 made because by, of course, by about two or three series, they've been covered in gunge. Squirting with water. It's actually what um, Sally James is asking about. Yeah, exactly. So they, they go through quite. I mean, this one, uh, 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 Phil Fletcher, who does Hacker, and um, was mentioning this before. This is actually one of the nicest looking of the Sooty Puppets. It was made by uh, Patsy B, who were a company based in the UK. And every time they did a run of the toys, they get a run of special ones done like this. So let's, this let's, let's, um, I wanted to just an experiment, ladies and gentlemen. Please indulge me here. I want to check. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very, very different. But I haven't, I haven't had a sniff of Zippy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we should. Come on, Zippy. Come on, Zippy. <laughs> Let me look through. We're just going to pop the right away. And I'll just have a quick oh. sniff of. Um, uh, all right then. Do you mind if I? Do you mind? No if I... tongues. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the thing: they all have different smells. Yeah, I'm pristine. You're pristine. Hello, pristine. Oh, hello. <laughs> no, no, oh, it's my friend. No, not pristine. Hello, Hartley. <laughs> You've met before, you've met Oh, we know each other for, we've known each other for years. Yes. We're rivals. Have you met uh, Sooty? 
Oh, yeah, he's appeared on Rainbow many times, yeah. Yes. With Matthew Corbett, do you remember him? Yes, we, we remember Matthew oh, Corbett. Yeah. Uh, now, Zippy, you are uh, yet another very different kind of... Um, I beg your pardon, I'm unique. <laughs> I'm not sure. Do you think... Do you think they get offended if I call them puppets? Ah! They be allowed to be. Uh, you're Later. a different kind of person, um, Zippy. Yeah. Um, and your friend Bungle. Yes. Who, George, don't forget George. Was, I remember remember George. George was very quiet. Yes. And well, you used to call Bungle Bungle Bones. Which I, I did, yes. Which I thought was a little... Well, a little... Unkind. Say it, say it. A little unkind. Oh, no, no, he's had a big head. That's the problem. <laughs> But you were definitely the loud mouth of the... Oh, well, not the loud mouth, the, 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 uh, the mouth with the zip, that's what I would say. Yes, and they did sometimes zip you up, didn't they? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, because sometimes I spoke too much, you see, yes. Well, yes, it's not really like not. today, I've got... Surely not, surely not. No, no, hardly, no. You sweet quite a lot, don't you? Well, when I get the chance. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we are. I feel like I'm on blind date here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything you want to add to that, Sooty? No, not a lot. <laughs> um, was it, uh, have you, did you always do Zippy? I, well, I know, I've done other puppets, but yes, I did Zippy from 1973 till the end of the series on Thames, and then I carried on doing Zippy a bit after that as well. Now, recently, um, my, my friend um, John Good at, at uh, Radio London had oh, you lovely, yes, sure. Joe's lovely, yeah. And uh, I, she sent me a message saying, I've got Zippy in. And I thought, isn't this a bit strange? Well, it's a radio show, right? And it's a radio show, and he has Zippy guesting on it. And yet, wasn't it uh, Peter Bruff who had well, Archie Andrews yes. as his, as his uh, ventriloquist dummy, who had many, many successful radio series? So. It isn't just the visual part of the puppet, the, the, the voice is very important too. Oh yes, it's all part of the character, the voice and the puppet, you know, are linked obviously. But you didn't originally do the voice. No, 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 a wonderful man, well, Peter Hawkins, we've seen some of his work. He was the original Zippy way back in the first series. And then wonderful Roy Skelton, sadly no longer with us, carried on with Zippy. And a voice, George as well, that, you know, spoke to himself. And then I took over when Roy died. Did, did Roy Skelton not also play Bungle? No, 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 no. A lovely guy called Stanley Bates Stanley played Bates. Bungle Bates. 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 Yeah. Uh, I get mixed up with these strange people who are inside. <laughs> um, did you know, by the way, that the Wombles, the Wombles, of course, are also, you know, puppet suits. Uh, the Wombles were all made uh, by Mike Bat's mum. She made every single one of the Womble costumes. And it brings me to the question of who makes these things? Who made who made Zippy? Well, the original puppeteer was a lady called Violet Philpott, and she made the original Zippy slightly different to the one you see today. But John Thurtle from Playboy Puppets made the Zippies and Georges. In fact, he made the um, original George and carried on making George and Zippy right throughout the whole series. Yeah. And have you enjoyed being Zippy? I mean, is Zippy because you've done a lot of things, I mean, yeah, you've yeah. done an amazing number of things. I read your CV and kind of my job. And my oh. book. My book. <laughs> if you don't mind me mentioning it. No, I don't mind you mentioning it. Zippy and Me is out, uh, it came out in July, and uh, it's my sort of old, well, biography, you'll see lots of stuff in there. This was why he was on the radio, folks. Yes. Yes. Lovely Joe Good, yeah. Um, but you like Zippy as a character. Yeah, I mean, you get you get to you get to know them. You get to sort of feel for their character. I mean, it, I mean, again, puppets. You can say stuff that I would, a nice person that I am, would never say. But Zippy can get away with it. Puppets just get away with murder. They, it's wonderful. They get away with murder. You obviously are uh, uh, having a love affair with Sooty, Jeff, because clearly you really, you really, you're really into Sooty. <laughs> what do I say did you see that I did there? <laughs> what do I say to that? Yeah. Yeah. But you, you... I'll, I'll tell you something that's special about these things. It's the same as the reasons behind why I made the Nosey Parker is Go production. You grow up with things when you're a kid. You fall in love with those things. And it's the most amazing thing as an adult, and I'm sure you two agree, that, that when you grow up, you get to be involved in these things at a particular level. And it so enriches your life. Yes. You know, it really does. And it, it sort of... Certainly, by being involved in this aspect of things, um, 
it has enabled me to do things and to go places and to meet people that I would have never have ever done. It's a magic no, thing. Yeah, absolutely. There's a magic in absolutely. it. Absolutely. And Nigel and Hartley. Uh, yes. Or Hartley and Nigel. Oh, yes. Because um, <laughs> you've, I mean, you've pocketed all sorts of, of, of things. Um, is, is things. Hartley, is, what is he? <laughs> uh, it's hardly one of your favourites. Uh, well, yeah, because I, I was with him for nine years, uh, had the chance to develop the character over that period of time, so I think it's got to be. And uh, mind you, a lot of characters I've done have had long lives, so it's been good to be able to develop those characters over a period of time. We could go on forever, but uh, time's run short and we've got loads more to see and loads more people to meet. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a very, very big hand to <laughs>